So back in the USSR, dear prunes, glass onion, obla di obla da, wild honey pie, the continuing story of Bungalow Bill, while my guitar gently weeps, happiness is a warm gun, Martha, my dear, I'm so tired, blackbird, piggies, uh, Rocky Raccoon. <laughs> the three animals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why don't we do it in the road? No. Is that wrong? Yeah. After piggies, let's see. What did I miss? Oh, don't pass me by. Mm-hmm. Don't pass me by. Why don't we do it in the road? I will. Julia. Birthday. Your blues. Mother Nature's son. Uh, Sexy Sadie. Nope. Helter. Is that not right? Nope. Oh, wait, let's see. Birthday. At, your blues. After, after Mother Nature's son. Mother Nature's son. Everybody's got something to hide except me and my monkey, mm-hmm. Sexy Sadie, uh, Helter Skelter, Long, 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 Revolution One, Honey Pie, Savoy Truffle, Cry Baby Cry, Revolution Nine, Good Night. Damn, he did it. <laughs> I had a couple hiccups in there. Why bro. are there so many songs on that album? <laughs> There's it's a 30. Dumb album. There's Jesus. 30. <laughs> Welcome to I'd Buy That for a Dollar, a podcast about inexpensive, common, and underappreciated records that are waiting to be rediscovered. I'm your host, Sean Hartman, part-time Googler of outdated slang terms. What were you Googling? Be honest. I can't tell you. It's foreshadowing. Oh. You'll find out only if you keep listening to the rest of this episode, Jeremy. God, sarn it. Fine, I'll listen to the rest of the episode. Thank you. Okay, cool. I'm co-host Jeremy, and I just sold the rights to my new podcast, guys. Oh, no. Not this one, but a new one. A new one. Is a new upstart. Is it a better one than this? Be honest. No, it's really bad. Okay. Um, I sold it to Podify, which is like a new up-and-comer for uh, another company, and... It's called the Jeremy Ruggles Podcast. We talk about eating bugs, and we smoke some weed, and I I list my fit my World Cup conspiracies. Nice. Uh, Bro, have you ever done DMT? <laughs> Only for the Podify. <laughs> Just for the fans. I wonder if there's actually a thing called Podify. There probably is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, wouldn't, I didn't know if, whether or not you were joking. <laughs> Yeah, they paid me $84 million. <laughs> well, shoot, we should get in on some of that. Oh, no, this is this is for my podcast mansion. Not- our, our podcast mansion will be a separate mansion. Multiple mansions? Yeah. That's- <laughs> I don't want to be around you guys all the time. You're weird. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Old multiple mansions, Jeremy. <laughs> Yeah, we want to be around you and eat bugs and smoke weed and talk about <laughs> World Cup conspiracies all the time. So feelings mutual, bud. I got a great podcast just for you. <laughs> all right. Well, I am co-host Peter Cook, the director of a forthcoming documentary called Singing About Evil Women, where we explore the fact that there are more songs called Evil Woman than there have been actual evil women in human history. Oh wow! Ooh, interesting theory. I like this. Huh? I it, it you know what we kind of determined that there most of these evil woman songs are about one woman, Margaret Thatcher. Ooh, <laughs> take <Sing>. that! <laughs> uh, all of all of the evil women were either Margaret Thatcher or Henry Kissinger in disguise. <laughs> Yes, you, you have you seen this documentary? That is, I didn't... <laughs> That's my favorite YouTube channel. <laughs> well, we are not here to talk about an evil woman today. Yes, actually we are, aren't we? Well, I mean, we there is a song that we'll be talking about <laughs> called Evil Woman, we'll be featuring, but I, I, I didn't get the impression our featured artist is evil. Are we talking about Santana today? 
Who are we talking about? <laughs> a Santana evil? I don't don't tell me. I don't want to know. Oh wait, no, he did Black Magic Woman, not Evil Woman. I guess those aren't necessarily well, the same thing. And then, well, then he had the so you got to change your evil ways. <laughs> so right. you're probably <laughs> conflating two Santana songs. <laughs> All right, we figured it out. Also, I actually know who we're talking about today, and I wrote an elevator pitch for this album. We don't normally do this, but I just figured, why not? You guys want to hear my elevator pitch for this record? Yes. Okay. Mary McCreary is an immensely talented artist who is unfairly remembered as a footnote of more popular artists' careers, and her album Butterflies in Heaven is a minor masterpiece that deserves to be counted amongst the greatest debut albums of the 70s. I'm intrigued. All right. You want to hear the first song then? Yeah. Do go on. Side one. Track one. My soul is satisfied. By Mary McCreary. That's just the perfect way to kick off an album. I'm just like instantly hooked from the first song. It's got that gospel influence. It's got that awesome dynamic range of the vocal styles, some interesting chords, really good backup vocals, which by the way is Mary McCreary doing the lead and her own backup vocals. I, I was going to ask if that was all her. I, mean, yeah. she, I know she had experience in the backing vocals department which we'll get to later. But yeah, I uh, I had no idea she was so capable of uh, phenomenal lead work as well. Yeah, and I would say her doing her own backup vocals is actually kind of a staple of the Mary McCreary sound, and we'll get into that more as we go. But I, I love the string section on that song as well, and for me that's also one of those songs that kind of just keeps getting better the farther the song goes, you know, and just like it builds and then it gets funky and it's just, man, it's perfect. I'm ready to go. Once I hear that, that grabbed me right away as well. And after a couple listens, I think it's my favorite song on the album. I like all the things you said, plus it's that funky breakdown and anti-materialist lyrics, which I can get behind. And sort of like a message about social class and mm -hmm. probably uh, the best lyrics on the album too i would say like yeah the lyrics are maybe one of the weakest parts of this album for me but that song is the total package oh i thought i thought there were quite a few good lyrics on this album I'm, i wasn't super into the religious stuff that comes later but that's more of a personal thing it's not the 
quality is still yeah the quality is still good there. in my opinion but you know to each their own to each yeah, their own well <laughs> pretty strong album across the board from i've only listened to it a couple times and it was all just today because this is not easy to find digitally online no this is uh this is a not on spotify exclusive <laughs> this album is is not out there it's not in the digital world very much i yeah it's, it's fairly cheap i wouldn't say that it's necessarily plentiful in the dollar bins but you know if you keep an eye out you'll find a copy here and there and it yeah it is under mccreary and not mary russell true so mary mccreary is probably best known for the leon russell connection they were married for about five years and she changed her name to mary russell and they recorded two albums under the name Leon and Mary Russell. And their, their first album, the wedding album is everywhere. That, that is a record that is truly ubiquitous for dollar bin heads. Yeah. In fact, I initially was going to do the wedding album for this episode. That's one that I've loved for a long time. It was the first place I heard Mary McCreary, but then the more I thought about it, I didn't want to, take away any of the very like much deserved spotlight for Mary. You know, I didn't want to have to figure out how to split an episode between her and Leon Russell. And obviously Leon is a prolific and important enough artist to get his own episode later on, but I want to talk about Mary first. So here we are. And I think this album, her first solo album, butterflies in heaven is better than the wedding album, even though the wedding album has some, a couple really strong songs on there. Her, vo- her yeah her vocals on the wedding album are much more ethereal and textural than th- than the work that featured here yeah and the wedding album it's very uneven there's a good handful of songs that are just not good and the more i was listening to it and looking at it the best songs on there are the ones that are co-written by mary and it's kind of weird that she wasn't more involved in more of the record and just the more I listened to it, I kind of started to develop this theory that the wedding album would have been better if Mary was like truly an equal input on that one. And honestly, even though it would seem that Leon Russell like did her this, you know, gave her this huge spotlight, it kind of feels like he might have been holding her back, at least musically. Because this album is like written, arranged, and co-produced by Mary. Like she is way more in control on this album and it's a much stronger record as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did notice that she wrote every song on it. Yeah, I think there's two co-writing credits, maybe one cover, something like that. But yeah, she's the one in charge on this album for sure. You know who else really liked that song we just listened to? Melba Moore. Ah. She did a cover of My Soul is Satisfied on her 1975 album, Peach Melba. Oh, nice. Yeah. Previously featured artist, Melba Moore. Yeah. And I could definitely see how their work would, that one would admire the work of the other. Yeah, for sure. And Mary kind of seems like that, your favorite artist, favorite artist kind of person. Like, background singer of note, probably met a ton of people, but just never got that, you know, mainstream stardom for whatever reason. So, Peter, how long have you been familiar with Mary McCreary slash Mary Russell and the wedding album? Yeah, I've known her as Mary Russell because of the wedding album. In looking into the story of Mary and what she's done in preparation for this episode, I realized I've been listening to her for a lot longer than I've known her name. All right, so I've got a little bit of a story of how I came to be a Mary McCreary Mary Russell fan working at the record store. I I don't remember what was going on that day, but I remember it was like a particularly stressful day. And this woman came in and was buying some records and talked to me about stuff and asked me if I'd heard Leon Russell's The Wedding Album. I was not a Leon Russell fan at the time. I was like, no, I don't know that one. And then she gave me one of those like, what? You haven't heard The Wedding Album? Like, how could you? Which is like, just one of my least favorite responses ever when someone like asked if you've seen something it just instantly makes me want to never ever listen to or watch that thing that i'm being like obnoxiously judged for right now and that's pretty much what happened in that situation (laughs) 
So I'm sure you you did not check it out right away then. No, I think it was probably a few years before I was like, okay, fine. This is a good album. <laughs> yeah, and the, I remember this this one was like, well, you have to buy it now and take it home and dance around the house with your wife. Are you married? <laughs> <laughs> Everything about it was off-putting. And then when I finally did play this album for Sam like a few months ago, I think we got three tracks in and Sam was like, can we listen to something else? <laughs> when, it, when you listen to the wedding album? The wedding album, yeah. <laughs> I bought the wedding album, got into it, and around the same time, I actually bought this album, Butterflies in Heaven, not realizing that it was the same person. In fact, when I bought Butterflies in Heaven, in my head, I was thinking I was buying the Mary Clayton record. Just like, you know, two Marys, two uh, 70s soul singers, and then put it on. I was like, wait, this isn't what I was thinking, and started looking up. I was like, oh, this is Mary Russell. That's cool. And just kept going from there. Listened to her other material, learned about other bands she was in did you have any familiarity with her prior to sean saying this was his selection jeremy no are you at all familiar with like leon russell only from you and sean talking about it mentioning him in previous episodes (laughs) yeah all right we got a lot to learn just like probably many of our listeners so how about another song before we dive into that bio yes do it this is the much featured famous track on this album evil woman <laughs> we're looking at side one track five well, i like to talk to you about an is a jam and i was just looking at the credits on discogs here for that and i see that it's you know i see mary on lead and backing vocals but also piano which i did not realize until just now that she's also providing that yes mary is playing the acoustic piano on every track on this record there's only a little bit of other piano happening and those are other session players but yeah She's the the real deal. Singer, songwriter, amazing pianist. She's got it all. Yeah, I see that one was co-written with someone named Lawrence Hill, who he he also has one other writing credit. One of the songs on here, he contributed solely. I I couldn't find any information on who that is. I don't know if you... (laughs) No, I didn't find much either. And the one song that he wrote solely is probably my least favorite song on the album. So (laughs) Mirror, the, the final song. Yeah. So yeah, Mary's doing most of the creative work here and yeah, it's a pretty varied album too. I was very surprised to see that it was basically just one person writing the majority of it. Yeah. And believe it or not, her follow-up is even more varied. She has like a reggae single on there and like more rock overtones and even more production. Like there was a lot going on in the musical world of Mary McCreary. 
I noticed a lot of swing kind of rhythms, like triplets and stuff, that made me think there's probably some jazzy influence in there. I don't know if it's from Mary or the players or what, but it's definitely some uh, jazz going on. Yeah, that and, you know, those gospel chops. <laughs> those The gospel circuit has been famous for creating some of the greatest musicians for a very long time, and she was fully in that world, as we will shortly learn. So let's just dive into this bio real quick. Yeah, I'm curious what you were able to find on Mary. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I should say that real quick before I go to the info. It was very hard to find information on Mary. There's not a whole lot out there. There's no interviews that I could find written or recorded. It doesn't seem like Mary was really into the spotlight very much. I don't know if that was just circumstances or a personality thing or who knows but yeah information was very fragmented and i had to kind of patch stuff together from different places to get an idea of what her full story and career was but there's so much you know that could be enlightened at points there's a lot to her story that has just never been talked about and maybe never will so we're gonna i'm gonna tell you all the information i could possibly find and shed some light on this wonderful overlooked artist Mary was born February 8th, 1951, under the name Mary Rand. And can you guys have any guess of uh, where she grew up singing? In a church. Yes. Do we have to guess, like, which sect? I, I didn't even look it up. I don't know. Again, okay. there's not a ton of information. <laughs> that's that's too specific. <laughs> I just, I know we do a lot of guessing games, so I thought okay. it might be a fun <laughs> You were primed game, for but... a game, yeah. Yeah. Grew up in church. Say what you will about Christianity, but it has produced some of the greatest musical talents of the last few decades. Yeah. Every good singer we talk about, it seems like. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Mary made her recorded debut at age 10. She can be heard singing on a 1961 children's album by folk group The Limelighters called Through Children's Eyes. And in 1963... So she is like 12 or 13 at this point. She forms the gospel group The Heavenly Tones, along with friends Vet Stewart, Alva Mouton, and Tremaine Hawkins. They can be seen performing on an episode of the Maya Angelou show, which I didn't even realize was a thing. But you can find that on YouTube. There's, they do a few different songs. It's really good. And Mary is the one singing and playing piano. Yeah, I watched some of that. You sent that to Peter and I and... Yeah, the singing was bonkers. Mm -hmm. And then there's this really weird production thing where they like they're belting it out, like pouring their hearts out, and then it stops and there's not like a live audience. So it's just like silent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a weird energy on, on that episode, but the performances are just electric. They're incredible. Yeah. Um, extremely talented, especially because they were all like early mid teens at that point. Just nuts. The Heavenly Tones released a single and LP in 1966. The LP was produced by Reverend James Cleveland, who, if you're not familiar, is probably one of the biggest names in gospel music at this time, or really all time. In 1967, Tremaine Hawkins left the group and went on to become a Grammy award-winning gospel artist who is still active today. And she also sang back up on one song for Butterflies in Heaven, so they've remained on good terms ever since. So now a trio, the Heavenly Tones, also started working under the name Little Sister and began singing back up for Vet Stewart's older brother, Sylvester Stewart, and his new band, Sly. The Family Stone. <laughs> Sly and the Family Stone. <laughs> <laughs> that was a group effort between Jeremy and I. Yeah. Yeah. I was hoping you'd say Anne, though, Sean. But oh, damn. Time. Okay, well, I think we got it. Yeah. We'll fix it in post. Yeah, we'll clean it up. Our editor, he's he works wonders, I tell you what. Yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> it's funnier this way. Right, listeners? <laughs> so as Peter alluded to earlier, Mary can be heard on early Family Stone records, and you can also see her on some live footage, including their 1969 appearance on Dick Clark's American Bandstand. Interesting. Yeah. And I'm guessing she sang backups for others as well, correct? Yes, she got more into 
freelance backup singing after leaving Sly in the Family Stone in 1971. So she's not on every record. I don't I actually don't think she's on. There's a riot going on because oh, um, my research told me otherwise. But really, I, but I can't say for certain. I do. You, I'm sure you dug deeper than I did. Well, it. It was very hard to tell on the timeline of some of these things and like what she worked on and didn't. So it's it's possible she continued working with Sly Stone later than uh, you know seventy one embarking on her. Is this uh, this album is seventy one? This album is seventy three. She had been working on her own for about two years before this, mostly doing backup vocals and like studio work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a riot going on in seventy one, so it's. Sounds like it's right in the time frame that she broke free. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So maybe she wasn't there for the whole session for that album, but there were a lot of people was. involved in that session. Too. Yeah. From what I understand, that was a pretty chaotic time in Sly and the Family Stone. So not everybody really even knew what was happening at any point during, during that time. Yeah. They, they, uh, some of them weren't their best selves, let's say. Yes. <laughs> they created the best album though. That, yeah. One of the, greatest albums of all time for real real talk real talk so as i said not a ton of info my best guess is that around the time when she started working with little sister and sly and the family stone is when she would have changed her name to mary mccreary i think before this she was going under mary rand when she was in the heavenly tones and my best guess without any finding any proof anywhere is that this was most likely just because she was working with secular music at that point. And as we've talked about before, there can be a lot of pushback and stigma around a gospel artist crossing over into the secular world. Hmm. In 1970, in between the album stand and there's a riot going on, Sly Stone was given an imprint on the Atlantic label called stone flower. They only released four singles, two of them being by Little Sister. There was a push at that point to kind of launch them as their own group. The singles got attention from radio DJs who even flipped one of the 45s to get a third song in rotation. So there was excitement. People liked the songs. They're really good 45s. However, the records just didn't get enough promotional effort. Atlantic dropped Stoneflower after the first four singles, and I imagine probably wasn't pushing their material very hard. And Little Sister just was never able to take off on their own. Mary was replaced in the backup group when she left, and they kept going as the Sly and the Family Stone backup singers, but never launched their own separate career, unfortunately. And we said 1971, Mary begins working as a solo artist, mostly as a background session singer at first. And then in 1973, her friend DJ Rogers helps get her signed to Leon Russell's Shelter Records. Uh, DJ Rogers, if you're not familiar, is an an artist that is well worth looking into. His records aren't cheap, but they're definitely underappreciated and worth seeking out. I saw he was on this album. Yes, he is the actual producer and co-arranger of this record and does background vocals on one song, I think. Not to be confused with DJ Shadow. (laughs) tj rogers and dj shadow the two most confused artists of all time real talk this album was recorded at leon's new shelter church studios in tulsa oklahoma which as the name suggests was a former church that leon had purchased and converted into a recording studio This studio was a really important part of Tulsa's music history and was a destination for those seeking an authentic roots rock sound during the mid seventies. It has been recently restored and is currently a functioning recording studio once again. Nice. Yeah. So we've brought you up to the butterflies in heaven section. So I think I want to just actually talk about the lineup real quick before we play another song. The lineup on this record is Basically the same as the one that worked on DJ Rogers self-titled album, self-titled debut album that also came out in 1973 on shelter records. So this is a band that is pros and also has a lot of experience working together in this exact lineup. So that gives you a lot of the chemistry and sound and groove that's happening on this record. These are top notch guys. So we said, 
You got Mary McCreary leading the charge, doing all the piano lead vocals, most of the background vocals, but we also have some super heavy hitters. First off, Chuck Rainey on bass. Yeah. One of the greatest basses of the era or any era played with Aretha Franklin, Quincy Jones, Steely Dan, the Crusaders, Roberta Flack, and many, many more. The man is a true legend. He was on the Cheryl Lynn album that we did. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, he has that great story of working on Steely Dan Asia, the song Peg, they told him not to slap. And he was like, this song needs slapping. And he just kind of turned their back and started <laughs> put, throwing some slap bass in there so that they couldn't see. <laughs> he turned his back to him. And yeah. As if you can't hear slapping bass. <laughs> Are you slapping over there, Chuck? <laughs> nope, nope, nope. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Subtle. Yeah, he's like, this. that's what this needs. Yeah, he's a legend. There's a great episode of Quest Love Supreme interviewing Chuck Rainey and Bernard Purdy at the same time. And in talking about players from this time, both of them had nothing but the highest praise for the guitarist on this record, David T. Walker. Um, I believe the quote was that they said that he was truly special. Like he was the guy to them that stood out amongst the crowd of great guitarists of the era. And I got to say, for my money, he might be my favorite guitarist of all time. David T. Walker is absolutely incredible. And I love his work on this album. Well, you're consistent. That is not the first time you've claimed that on this pr- podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's so good. He's got, those little, he's got those little melodic flourishes that he does that I've just never heard anybody replicate. He has just such a distinct sound, great ear, wonderful dynamic. He could back people up, and he had a bunch of really good solo records, too, which, as I'm sure I said last time, we will feature one eventually. Yeah, was he uh, was David T. Walker on the the Cheryl Lynn episode or the album as well? I think he was. He, you know, we've mentioned him a few times. That's why I think Jeremy thought of radio. Oh, I, Which, I was just thinking Sean claimed that Ray Parker was the best guitarist on that oh, episode. Oh, that's why you were saying because okay, okay, I, I was see. calling him out subtly. I see. See, I was like, well, it wouldn't have Ray Parker have been the guitarist on radio, but yeah, I see where you're well, going. Did, with I, this. did I say he was the best or did I say he was my favorite? Oh, good question. Mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. There's no way we could know, so we'll just move <laughs> on. On drums, you have either Andy Newmark or Scott Sansby. Andy was in the Family Stone for the albums Life and Small Talk. Uh, his work on Life, in particular, is. Very notable, very funky drummer. Scott Sansby was a guy that was working with DJ Rogers at the time and doesn't have a ton of credits, but he's playing real good on this record. And then we also have a couple appearances from Clarence McDonald on clavinet and electric piano. He was a session player and songwriting legend who wrote the song Lovely Day for Bill Withers. And then Classic song. Yeah. On background vocals for one track, we have Max Ann Lewis who was from the band Maxan, which later became known as Mandre. Another dollar bin favorite that we will definitely feature. And you also have Keith Hatchell on bass, and I think one track on here. And that's most of the lineup, aside from the strings and horn section. You guys want to hear another song? Yes. I think right. so. We're going we're gonna to play the song Rudy Poot. You guys know what that oh, means? Yeah. I don't, but this song is awesome. This song is awesome, and the title is an outdated slang term that I had to Google. Oh. <laughs> Rudy Poot is a outdated AAVE term that basically just means an idiot. What's AAVE mean? African American vernacular. vernacular English. English. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, uh, usually a male and just someone who is uh, generally incompetent or a fool. They're Rudy Poot. Hmm. So I I hate the title less now, knowing that. (laughs) I just thought it was like a gross-sounding word, and I was like, "Ooh." Yeah, when I first heard, I was like, "That's a I don't like that." I just it just sounds dumb. But this song slaps, and I looked it up. It's supposed to sound dumb. That's what it means. Yeah, no, it all makes sense. It connects now. All right, this is side two, track two.
That is a jammer. I love the rhythmic elements going on. This is where I take back my my lyric thing, though, just for that one word. <laughs> because even just hearing it again, I'm like, I just don't like how that word sounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not a big poot fan. Interesting. Not a, a poot fan, I guess. Rudy's fine. <laughs> Put them together, though, Jeremy's out. And for that reason, yeah. Jeremy's out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it probably kept people in check. They didn't want to get called that and have to hear that terrible yeah, <laughs> combination fair. of words. Fair. <laughs> Great piano work on that one, though. I'd, yeah, I wanted I'd to call attention that. to that, too. Like, she's not she's not faking it on piano. Like, she could have just been the pianist on this record. She's killing it on that track. Yeah, I, you know, I hadn't really looked into... The credits beforehand, and it adds a whole new level to it, knowing that she's on the piano as well. Mm-hmm. And it's just got that gospel energy. It's got those gospel chops, but it's it's something her own. And you know, you gotta think of the Aretha Franklin comparisons, but she's still got something different, while still being able to belt it out almost just as good as Aretha. Honestly, I re- I might prefer Mary's belt. Honestly. I really like how she doesn't she doesn't do it a lot in this album and when she does it feels really honest mm. and at times there's this like growl she goes into when she's belting that just gives me like shivers. Yeah. You get the feeling like she only she only does it if she's feeling it, you know? Like that wasn't written into the song. The performance was just that good that it called for it. Yeah, it didn't feel like you know, trying to show off vocally or anything like she was in it. It's mm-hmm. uh, it, it may help that she is the writer of the songs. It, yeah, it doesn't. It feels like her vocal performances are in service to the song, not being overly acrobatic. Yeah, yeah, you can definitely tell on some songs. Like I, I bet the artist only heard these songs recently when the songwriter dropped it off and taught it to him. You know, but this album feels a little more lived in. For sure. And like I, like I said, that studio vibe had to have just been great. These were all friends. It was a cool studio. The space sounds awesome. Like, it just, it must have been great for the sessions. So let's finish out this Mary bio. She followed this album up with her second album, Jezebel, in 1974, this time produced by Leon Russell. As I said, it's really good. It's even more varied. I don't have that one yet, so I haven't spent as much time with it, but worth picking up for sure. She is prominently featured on backup vocals on Leon Russell's 1975 album, Will of the Wisp. And the two were married in 1975 and released the wedding album as Leon and Mary Russell in early 1976. You can also see a performance of one of the singles from that album on an episode of Saturday Night Live from like late spring of 76. Oh yeah, that's like pretty much towards the beginning of Saturday Night Live. That might have been first season, I think. It, yeah, I think it yeah. would have been. In interviews during the time, Leon would freely admit that he thought Mary was more talented than him. And for a while, there was a concerted effort to really push her as a solo artist, or at least it appeared that there was. Um, I even found an account of a Leon Russell fan who saw him in concert around this time and was very disappointed and felt like he was tricked into attending a Mary Russell concert instead of Leon Russell, who he thought he was going to see. So, like, she was out there. He was trying to put the spotlight on her and don't know why it didn't work. She had the talent. Some things just don't happen. Well, how, you know, I, I don't know if you would have looked into this in your research, Sean, since you were focusing on Mary. I know Leon Russell is a known entity, but how big was he as an artist at the time? At the time, Leon was probably about as big as he ever was, from what I understand. Like, he had released a string of very successful records. He was known as a huge concert draw. I man, I wish I had this information in front of me. Like I said, eventually we'll do a Leon episode and we can get all the facts right. But I think at one point he was listed as like the top touring artist of that year shortly before this. So he was a big deal. People knew about Leon Russell at this time. Yeah, when Leon Russell passed away about six years ago, it was definitely a, a big deal to people 
20 plus years older than myself you know like born around like 1960 or so they he was someone who they remembered as being a big deal when they were young but it's just it didn't seem to carry over he's not someone i heard people talking about much anymore yeah in my brief research and looking through a few forums related to the wedding album it seems that like most leon russell fans kind of regard that as the beginning of the end for him like it caps off a string of really good records people have mixed opinions about it and then a few of the records he did shortly after that are are pretty reviled and he never hit the same peak of fame and it seems like not too long after this was kind of just a forgotten artist himself for a lot of people but he you know he had a loyal fan base for the the heads who knew about leon russell yeah, there was a time where this is going to sound silly, but I think there was a time where I mixed up Leon Russell and Re- Leon Redbone. <laughs> Ooh, Very another one of my favorites who we absolutely must feature soon. Yeah, that should definitely happen. We got are the you, Leon. Are you more of a Leon Russell or Leon Redbone fan, Peter? I, you know, I, I probably Who's your favorite Leon. <laughs> I guess I need. I will have to feature both, and I'll find out, and I will report back because. I know a handful of songs by both, but you know, and, and a little bit okay. of material. Well, whenever one of us selects a Leon Russell or Redbone, we'll have to make sure that the following week is the other artist so we can do an AB comparison. Ooh. <laughs> the Leon. Yep. All right. Cool. <laughs> the Leon battle. <laughs> the battle for the ages. Choose your favorite Leon. Okay, so Leon and Mary Russell released a follow up album in 1977 called Make Love to the Music. It is pretty much universally regarded as not nearly as good as the first one. And then Leon also played on Mary's third solo album, Heart of Fire, which I believe Mary wrote and produced pretty much all of again. I haven't spent as much time with that one as well. It's not impressed me very much, but I'm sure there are some moments that I will dig into when I actually track down a copy. And then the two were divorced in 1980. They were married for just five years. Not a lot of information, but from what I could tell, it was a pretty messy divorce. And I only know that because after finding some interviews with their son, I learned that when they divorced, Mary took the kids and did not allow Leon to see them for about 10 years. Did either of them go on to make a good post-divorce album? I saw it referenced that some of Leon's records after this are talking about missing her and it's like unrequited love kind of thing and you know maybe that was part of the reason why his records weren't very good maybe he was in a bad place and not a nice person at that point i don't know because there's just not a lot of information but i do know that not allowing your ex to see kids for 10 years is a rather extreme stance so something happened yeah yeah maybe there's a reason we can't find much information yeah for real there's there's something else going on and Uh, It definitely seems that Mary was a very private person and Leon from the interviews that I could find seems uh, reluctant to talk about this stuff too much. Was the third Mary solo album the last one she did? No. Um, And after the divorce, Mary went back to using her original last name Rand and she self-released a gospel album in 2005 called Still Together and another in 2015 called Love and Praise, which as far as I can tell, you can only purchase from her or her website if you can't even do it from there anymore. Maybe it's somewhere else as well, but neither of those are listed on Discogs. It seems like they're a pretty small private press CD kind of thing, but mm-hmm. she's still out there working in some small capacity i found an old website of hers that hasn't been updated in a minute she's got a facebook page that has been updated very infrequently and not a lot of presence aside from that so if mary ever hears this we love your music we'd love to know more if you want to fill us in on any of the details of your wonderful career email us at i'd buy that podcast at gmail.com well, now I'm excited. I hope we get an email. <laughs> it's, ha- it's happened <laughs> multiple times. Now. Yeah, so you never every so often. Never know. And yeah, I'm just so curious, you know, like there's obviously tons of stories of someone who wanted to get famous and just the stars never aligned for whatever reason. And there's also tons of examples of people who just didn't have the personality or ego 
to like hit that level of fame. You know, it, it could have been any of those options for Mary. I'm not sure, but the lack of interview and just the, the general presence that I could find of her online definitely makes it seem like she's kind of a, more of a reserved private person that maybe wasn't built for huge pop stardom. Who knows? Yeah, I wouldn't, you know, not everyone wants uh, three guys from Michigan talking about them on a <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sean, two guys from Michigan and one transplant to Philadelphia. Yeah. I'm a Philadelphia local now. Don't you forget it. <laughs> it's still from Michigan in my heart. Yeah, but I don't want to be hassled anymore. I'm a local. Valid. He is local. Please do not hassle Sean Hartman when you see Thank him on the streets. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think it is time for us to talk about some recommended similar albums. And Sean, if you, if you don't mind, I'm, I might throw one in before you Ooh, this time. Before? What? Not only do you steal Jeremy's thunder of introducing the recommended if you like segment, but you're going to start it off like this is a major upset. This is this is New Year, New Peter over here. I love it. Oh yeah, Happy New Year, by the way, everyone. Mm-hmm. 2023, best year yet. I'm here for this New Peter, actually. <laughs> yeah, taking charge, leading the charge. Yeah. Let's oh. go. What's the album, Peter? Well, it's one that we've talked about previously, and that would be Roberta Flax. Feel like making love. Of course you took one of my three picks. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of thought that might happen. <laughs> That's why you wanted to go first. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> wow. Full power play this year, Peter. I like it. Damn. Yeah. Are you going to do your fake title first in the next episode? Like what's next in new year, new Peter. Welcome to I'd buy that for a dollar <laughs> a podcast about inexpensive, common and underappreciated records that are waiting to be rediscovered. I'm your host and only host, Peter Cook. Oh, yeah, it needs some work. I've heard better. <laughs> You've done it like 160 plus times. Yeah. So. And I haven't started screwing up on it until recently. What is that? I guess it's time for a, a new change. I'm slacking. I've gotten too comfortable in my yep. position. <laughs> yep. Watch the throne. All right. Okay. Well, I guess I'm going to read off my two recommended albums now. First up, David T. Walker, Press On, also from 1973. Got a handful of the same session players on it. Is just an incredible record. Everyone should listen to David T. Walker. He's the best. End of story. Yeah. And he was on that Cheryl Lynn album, by the way. I looked it up. Oh, nice. Cool. I wonder how many times we've actually heard his work on featured albums it's gotta be a few at this point yeah he's come up a number of times i feel like all right and my other recommended album is marion williams the album is called standing here wondering which way to go came out in 1971 for those who are not familiar marion was a gospel music legend who had by 1971 was over 25 years into her career and recorded a record with Bernard Purdy on drums, Keith Jarrett, and Joe Zawinul on piano, of all people, and a few other surprise players. And the album is also also mostly pop and folk covers, like a Pete Seeger cover on there. And it's just a great record, pretty cheap. And that's the, that's the gospel comparison, the female-led gospel music from the Dollar Bin suggestion. And then, you know, go buy that Roberta Flack record, because it's awesome. And check out the episode yes oh right well did you have anything else regarding uh mary i think we did it let me just quickly uh skim my notes make sure i didn't forget anything important Mm -hmm. doesn't look like it Uh, heavenly tones grew up singing in church okay we're good all right (laughs) fantastic well yeah this is i i will say this album really is wonderful i think it's a classic album that's really waiting to be rediscovered i mean you know we always in theory that's what we're always doing with this show but this one i really you know this is a candidate for one that should be better known cool i'm I'm really happy that you think that because honestly when i wrote my elevator pitch part of me was like are they just going to argue with me about it are they gonna be like whoa minor masterpiece there's a few good songs dude chill out no, and it's only, I think it's only about half an hour or so long, so I don't think there's, uh, they, there's you know, there's no fluff. No fat to trim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah, it's a great record all the way through. If you don't mind the uh, religious gospel overtones at time, and uh, I don't, yeah, I love this album, love this artist, 
I've got more records to pick up from her and hopefully many of our listeners are now fans and we'll be checking it out soon too. Maybe the wedding album will be worth $3 someday instead of the $1 that it seems to forever be sold at. Well, I look forward to talking about Leon Russell and Leon Redbone sometime down the road here, but I'm we glad might have that to we, do uh, that soon. I'm kind of excited about that, honestly. Yeah. yeah I think our, our listeners are, are ready for that too. And, uh, but I am, I, it was very wise to give Mary the spotlight here, Sean. So let me just commend you on that. Oh, thank you. I accept your commendation. <laughs> well, let's be done with this episode and enjoy 2023 now. <laughs> yeah. What are we leaving on Sean? What song? We're going to go out on the title track, butterflies in heaven side two, track one. Butterfly kisses at night in heaven. In heaven. <laughs> I thought one of us was going to go to the reading rainbow theme. Like, it. It's got to be you. Go for it. Take it away, Peter. Peter. Thank you for listening to I'd Buy That for a Dollar. <laughs> My name is Peter Cook. I'm co host Jeremy. I'm co host Sean. <laughs>